So this is uh, Mark Kedick. Um, he's going to be giving us a presentation on uh, Perplex. So a little bit of a, little bit of a background uh, on Mark. Uh, Mark's uh, an associate professor in the Department of uh, Geosciences at Virginia Tech. Uh, he got his bachelor's degree at University of Bristol and then went on to do his uh, doctorate at University of Cambridge. Following that, uh, he went on a postdoctoral fellowship to ETH Zurich uh, with Alan Thompson and Jamie Connolly. And this is how he became immersed in the world of Perplex. So Mark's got pretty diverse research interests. Um, the, the, some of them are posed as, as questions. What can we learn from zoned metamorphic minerals? Uh, what controls metamorphic texture? Uh, subduction zone processes uh, and uh, high temperature and ultra high temperature metamorphism. And here's kind of an unusual one, mineralogy in the aviation industry. And one thing I say, uh, I would say about Mark is it doesn't matter what you have a conversation with him about, you always come away both entertained and educated. So uh, I welcome Mark to uh, lead us through Perplex. Thank you, Dave. I will, I will try to uh, entertain and educate today. Um, perhaps this will be the day where I fail on both counts. We will see. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see my screen at the moment. Um, thank you all for being here from all over the world and, and welcome to day two of our workshop. Um, I'm going to show a there we go. I'm going to show a slide now that, that Dave showed yesterday, and this is who you are. And this who you are slide suggests that we've got just about the entire range of um, career stages on this line. We've got just about the entire range of expertise in um, phase equilibrium modeling. And we've got uh, a good number of people who have experience with Perplex. Presumably some of these people have got a lot of experience with Perplex. And we've got some people who, who don't at all. And so that sets me with a challenge of how do I pitch this talk? And I'm sad to say that it's pretty much impossible to uh, put together a talk that will satisfy everybody. In fact, it might be impossible to put together a talk that, that satisfies anybody. But what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to go with the, the, the sort of more basic end of this. I'm just going to give an overview of what Perplex is and some of the things that it can do. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the strategies that it employs to do that, um, some of the strategies that really define what Perplex is. I'll give a brief introduction to how calculations are structured in Perplex. What I won't do is give a detailed how-to for any given problem. That, that would be beyond the time we've got here. I also won't give an overview of the, the parameters required for a good uh, quote-unquote result in Perplex, partly because there is no sort of one size fits all strategy for a, a good calculation. I won't really have the time to do a deep dive into everything that Perplex can do and exactly how it does it. I certainly will not be drawn into a question, at least not today, about whether Perplex is better or worse than any of the other packages we're going to talk about in this, this workshop. And I'll try to avoid questions uh, or, or um, direct statements about um, whether certain thermodynamic data and solution models are better than others. Um, although maybe that's a discussion that, that might be had later on in the week. So the way I'm going to organize this, we will start with a, a real background. Where's Perplex found? Where can you find it? Where can you learn a little bit about it? Then we'll talk about how its strategy uh, is different to thermocalcs. And so this strategy section of the talk, that will probably be um, you know, a substantial proportion of this talk. Then we'll move on to in practice, if you're approaching Perplex for the first time, what does a calculation involve? And I won't go into a lot of detail there, but I'll just pull out some points, some, some key points. Then I'm going to talk about uh, end member and solid solution models, what's available. Uh, and then in response to a couple of questions that were posted in the chat yesterday that we didn't have time to discuss, I'll show a little bit about how those are coded in Perplex, what they look like in Perplex. Then, although I don't want to say um, Perplex is better or worse than any other program, I will compare it or its outputs to outputs from Thermocalc. I think um, this is an important, will become an important thing to do. Then I'll talk a little bit about um, how would one would 
calculate phase abundances and compositions and physical properties of our system and how one would contour them. And then I'll end by talking about phase fractionation. And then right at the very end, I'll talk, I'll uh, just give a little summary and, and some reference lists. Okay, so what is Perplex? At, at some fundamental level, it is, it is a calculator. It is just a calculator. It accepts thermodynamic data. It uh, performs operations, calculations on those to yield um, phase equilibria. It is not a program. It is a modular set of um, codes, all command line operated. And they're all available here from Jamie Connolly's ETH website. On that website, you can also download all of the thermodynamic data uh, that's required for Perplex in an appropriately formatted um, context. On that website, you can also find tutorials. Um, many of them are very good. Many of them are also very out of date because the codes evolved substantially in the last decade, actually probably in the last 20 years or so. And some of those tutorials that are available online, including information of mine, some of them are, are very out of date. Um, there's also a user group that you can register at here, and this is a sort of a vibrant collection of, of um, conversations about Perplex. I've just put some statistics here. These um, numbers might be very small, but you can see that in an average month, there are somewhere of the order 20 emails back and forth in conversations about all things related to Perplex. And so if you're trying to get um, to grips with the program, if you come up against problems, either post uh, here and, and somebody will, will try and answer your question, or even better than that, dive into the archives, because I'm sure other people will have found similar problems to you. Okay, so again, what is Perplex? Okay, it's a very flexible suite of, of codes that would allow you to, to generate uh, PT projections, system composition, dependent phase diagrams, um, so those could be um, PT pseudosections or, or um, um, sort of fixed composition diagrams. We can do compatibility diagrams, mixed variable diagrams. We can uh, explore fluids. Won't talk about fluids that much today, but we'll we'll come back to them again on Friday. Um, we can we can calculate new mu diagrams. We can do TX, PX. Um, we can uh, calculate diagrams where one or several phases are progressively fractionated from the system composition as the um, as the metamorphic process that we that we're simulating uh, develops. Perplex has been particularly widely adopted by the geodynamics community uh, and hopefully by the end of this talk it'll be a relatively clear why that's the case. It's written and maintained by Jamie Connolly in Zurich and um, almost the entirety of its code is uh, of Jamie's. A few, a few people have added little add-ins here and there, but this really is Jamie's baby. Uh, it's coded in Fortran. The source code is not available for open download, um, but, but Jamie will often make it available on request. Um, the algorithm dates back to the uh, late 1980s, um, but it's, been, uh, it's undergone significant and substantial updates, particularly in the last few years. I've put a series of, of papers here that um, describe some of Perplex's algorithms. I'm not going to talk through any of them now. They will reappear on the last slide. You'll be able to download a PDF of today's talk, and there'll be uh, an extended version of this in that PDF. Importantly, and this, this is an image that I stole from Pierre Lenaro from yesterday's talk, Perplex isn't tied to a particular set of thermodynamic data. So, it sits here in, in, in uh, Pierre's little cartoon of our thermodynamic world, and it can take um, thermodynamic data from any of these sources. It would allow you to mix thermodynamic data from these sources if you wanted, but I suspect that that's not advisable. Okay, so Dave Waters yesterday told us about Thermocalc, and I think it's important at this point, before we go any further, just to think about what are the key differences in strategy between Thermocalc and Perplex. And so, as I've written out here, Perplex will calculate the identities, abundances, and compositions of phases that yield the lowest Gibbs free energy at a given PT condition or range of PT conditions. So, the user identifies the range of phases, which can be minerals or melts of fluids, that, that we're interested in and that the, the code should consider. 
the program decides which of these subset is stable as a function of pt and x, where x is composition. For public to do this, it requires one absolutely critical assumption that I'll come back to uh, and explain in a little more detail in about 10 minutes' time. That differs fundamentally to um, thermocalc, which will find the conditions of, of equilibrium for a much smaller group of phases. Um, so it will find for a small subset of phases where delta G of reaction equals zero. And that requires, as Dave Waters talked about yesterday, um, some idea of starting guesses of phase compositions for the, for the solver. So in a really trivial case, I mean, the most trivial case I could think about, the difference between perplex and thermocalc uh, would um, result in this. Let's say we wanted to calculate the alumina silicate um, triple junction. A thermocalc user would say to thermocalc, tell me where the Gibbs free energy of andalusite and silimonite are equal, and, and thermocalc would tell them, well, that's your line. The user would then say, tell me where andalusite and kyanite, that's the line. Then tell me where the Gibbs free energy of silimonite and kyanite, that's the line. The user would then um, use some logic, some, um, some prior knowledge, some, some Schreinemacher's logic, to figure out which parts of these curves are metastable, delete them, and there's our phase diagram. Perplex differs substantially from this. It will say at this point, the Gibbs free energy of silimonite is less than that of kyanite or andalusite. Therefore, at this point, silimonite is stable. In fact, silimonite is stable at all of these points, except for the green one at the bottom, where the Gibbs free energy of andalusite uh, is lower. If we repeat this again and again and again, we can begin to build up our phase diagram. Now, for the case of andalusite, kyanite, silimonite, this is actually trivial, and we don't need anything as complex as perplex to do this. But in cases where we have um, phase equilibria with complex solid solutions, uh, that's where some of perplex's strategies really uh, come, to, come to the fore. And so before I talk about um, mineral solutions in detail, let's just look at these dots here, and let's work this out into a slightly more um, organized strategy that Perplex uses. Each of these minimizations to figure out here that silimonite is more stable than kyanite or silimonite or kyanite or andalusite, each of these minimizations takes a finite amount of time. In this case, for this simple minimization, the, the amount of time is, is milliseconds. But for a complex suite of um, potential minerals, fluids, melts, um, these minimizations can take more time than we would like. Therefore, we don't want to waste a lot of time on a lot of minimizations. And so the key strategy number one that Perplex uses in this context is gridded minimization, which basically means that if we have a pressure versus temperature plot that we're going to build up here, Perplex will um, conduct minimizations on a sparse set of PT points indicated in red here. It will then take the results of this sparse set. It'll compare them. It'll see whether um, the results, let's say of these four are the same or different. And then it will decide whether it needs to do more minimizations on a coarser grid in the middle here. Um, identified in green. If it needs to do work on the green ones, then it'll say, okay, let's look at the results of these green ones and figure out whether I need to do more work in the middle here. So let's have a look at an example of what this might look like. This is a, a sort of a hypothetical solution. This is a phase diagram that we know the answer to, Perplex does not, and we want Perplex to approach this. And so what Perplex will do is it will um, conduct minimizations on these big red dots here, and it will take the results of these and it will compare them. Because it's not doing many minimizations, this will not take it very long. When I say will not take it very long, I might mean um, seconds, I might mean minutes, I might need hours, and I'll give you some examples of that later. But what Perplex will find is that all of these red dots, even though they, um, there might be different mineral proportions and different, minim, uh, minim, uh, different mineral compositions at these red dots. 
the identities of the assemblage are the same. The same minerals are in the assemblage. And so Perplex thinks that it does not have to do any more work here. If we take a look at these red dots, Perplex realizes that there's a, at least one phase boundary between the two. And so it will conduct minimizations on a finer grid in this region. In fact, it will conduct minimizations in a finer, finer grid wherever it thinks that there are phase boundaries. And so we think we've got phase boundaries, we do more minimizations. We then compare the results of these. We say there's something different going on here. We, we zoom in on a, on a finer and finer and finer grid. And so Perplex is never actually solving for precisely where these lines are. It's just iteratively making the distance between these um, minimizations where it thinks that there's a phase boundary, it's making those distances smaller and smaller and smaller. And so uh, if we stop that grid there, we'd get a diagram like this. And Perplex gives the user um, some options to control how this works. And so I'll talk through the structure of a calculation in a minute, but within that calculation, there's an options file, and within that, there are, there are parameters that control how many red dots there should be in this cartoon here. Um, how many levels of color should there be, red dots, the green dots, the white dots, the black dots, so on and so forth. So how much it refines the initial um, solution. So if I, if I actually run uh, a calculation, just like we spoke about uh, in Perplex, this might be a result. So this is a calculation fresh out of Perplex with, with no modification for a simple thermodynamic system. All fluids also contain, uh, all fields contain fluid here, um, calculated with these thermodynamic data. We can see that it's blocky. And it's blocky because I set a low resolution, um, low spatial resolution, not very many minimizations. If I improve the or increase the numbers of minimizations, I can go from this output. Uh, sorry, I should say this output just took probably five minutes for me to set up and then somewhere between 15 and 20 seconds for Perplex to run. If I increase the resolution, the, the, the calculation time will increase, um, the quality of the result will increase. And so this is what we might expect to get directly out of Perplex. Um, this took um, under two minutes to run. Um, this is a simple phase diagram, pressure, temperature, simple chemical system. And this shows us about the, the stabilities of phases within this. We could use the same strategy that we've used for pressure temperature diagrams for temperature fluid composition diagrams. So this shows us the, um, the water CO2 ratio or CO2 water ratio in a uh, fluid that is um, saturated uh, in this uh, simple system, calcium, magnesium, iron, silicon, uh, water and carbon dioxide. I should note here that, um, as I say, this is directly out of Perplex with no um, editing of the graphics of it at all. Um, these codes, OHP, CPXHP, those are the codes for um, mineral solution files, uh, mineral solution models that, that Perplex knows. If we, if we zoom in on this field down here, this is telling us that dolomite would coexist with quartz and magnesite and siderite. The lowercase minerals here are end members, pure end member magnesite, pure end member siderite. This is a mixing model, a, do a dolomite mixing model. The important, or well, one of the important um, things we, we might conclude from this is well, shouldn't magnesite and siderite potentially um, form a solid solution? Maybe so. Shouldn't Perplex have told us that? Potentially so, but I didn't ask it to. I did not give it a solid solution um, for these minerals. I didn't tell it that a solid solution could exist. Therefore, it can only give us the end members in this particular trivial example or relatively trivial example. Okay, so that's how it, it organizes where it does minimizations. But to be able to do this in the first place, we need to be able to um, have a strategy for dealing with complex solution models. And this is Perplex's big fundamental assumption. And it's a term that Jamie calls pseudocompounds. And this pseudocompound uh, assumption, pseudocompound approximation, 
both give Perplex its flexibility and it's the source for many of its difficulties. For, for those of you who have used Perplex before and didn't quite find the results exactly to your liking, didn't find exactly what you were expecting, um, a lot of those difficulties might be wrapped up in the, in the way that Perplex deals with these pseudo compounds. So let's, let's dig into that a little bit. Here we've got simple um, GX diagram composition uh, for three fictive minerals, A, B, and C. And we've got three sim simplified um, fictional GX uh, curves for those three minerals. And Perplex cannot find this tangent by solving uh, or directly solving equations for these curves here. What Perplex does instead is it discretizes these surfaces into separate points. Each one's a pseudo compound. So that's one pseudo compound for mineral C. That's another pseudo compound for mineral C. Oh, okay. And so Perplex generates a, a library of these pseudo compounds across the solution space of, of every phase uh, mineral melt fluid before minimization begins. And these compositions of, let's say, mineral A has got a composition here, a composition here, a composition here, and so on and so forth. For each of those compositions, which are fixed and cannot change, it's trivial to uh, calculate the, the free energy at that point as a function of pressure and temperature. Perplex then takes this um, suite of pseudo compounds, this sort of bag of pseudo compounds, and it minimizes um, to find which collection of them will result in the lowest uh, uh, system free energy, subject to this constraint that they all need to sum to the system composition. So that's, um, that's ultimately what Perplex is doing. This works really well. This approximation works really, really well if we can sample these surfaces, or in this case, these, these curves, really densely. If we can't, and we only sample them like this, um, we end up in prob with problems because this black curve is the real solution energy. These black dots are the places that we are, um, that Perplex knows about the energy. So it would join them up like this. If we draw a common tangent there, we would actually find that that common tangent goes through this composition of point of phase C and this composition of phase B. And so it would misidentify what the stable mineral assemblage is. Now, this really matters because every one of these pseudo compounds needs a little bit of memory and adds a little bit of time to, to the minimization. And so if we look at this simple binary here, that's actually a very trivial problem. Let's assume that this is olivine and orthopyroxene and garnet and we're only interested in iron magnesium. We can, we can describe that as iron and magnesium mixing in garnet like this, and we just densely put a lot of pseudo compounds across that binary, and that will um, replicate this curve very nicely. If we want to go up into a more complex chemical system, let's say we want our garnet to also include calcium, we then need to expand from our simple line here to this system here, and we need to populate everywhere within this triangle with pseudo compounds. So we need many more of these pseudo compounds. If we're going to do that for garnet, we need to do that for other phases in the system. And so we need to populate these surfaces with um, points of known composition at which the, the free energies can be calculated. If we want to include manganese, we now need to populate the entirety of the surfaces and interior of this tetrahedra with pseudo compounds. And so as we add more and more and more dimensions, we need more and more and more information uh, in our pseudo compound approximation. If we go up to more complicated uh, mineral solution models, if we think about um, the White et al. Uh, haplogrammic model, uh, that's got eight mineral end members. If we look at the Green et al. Amphibol model, that requires 10 end members. And so if we think about these end, this eight end members for this uh, melt model here, 
we're now thinking about an eight dimensional, um, uh, not even a surface at this point, it's sort of a, a hypersurface, an eight dimensional um, unit that we need to fill in with pseudo compounds if we want Perplex to um, be able to model it. Eight dimensions to um, populate, if we want to populate it densely, requires an enormous amount of information, enormous amount of pseudo compounds. An enormous amount of pseudo compounds requires an awful lot of system memory in the computer and an awful lot of time to solve. And so we sometimes find ourselves in a scenario that for complex minerals, we can't sample like this. We can only sample like this, in which case we would get the wrong answer at whatever pressure temperature this is being solved for. And so for those of you who have used Perplex before and, and had issues um, with certain phase boundaries, it's likely that they um, come down to this tension between wanting more uh, information in the diagram, where more information uh, or in the background that the perplex is calculating the diagram from, um, because that allows uh, smoother tracking of GX surfaces and smaller uncertainties. So we want that, but at the same time, we want fewer pseudo compounds because um, it makes for a faster calculation. We want our calculation to be done in minutes, hours, multiple hours, not days, weeks, months, particularly if the um, if there's no way, and this is this is uh, a, a, a important point about Perplex, once we've started that calculation running, there's no way of really knowing whether the diagram is actually going to be as useful for us as we would like. Um, and so we can't stop the calculation partway through, take a peek at what it's looking like, and then go, go back to it, at least not easily. And so um, we, we have this tension. Perplex and some helper programs that are associated with it have got strategies for how we handle this. Uh, and so let's have a look at um, two of those now. These are two um, strategies that are, have been implemented in Perplex for quite a long time now and, and work really quite well. And so the two strategies are, are adaptive refinement and pseudo compound iteration. Let's just take a look at this green um, curve here. Um, free energy uh, across a, a, a simple solution, a simple mineral. The adaptive refinement um, strategy, essentially what it does is it samples this rather sparsely. Um, we put very few pseudo compounds within here. We put very few pseudo compounds um, within all of the minerals that we're interested in. And we solve them very, very quickly. We, we compare them to see what minerals should be stable within our pressure temperature diagram. What Perplex then does, and this is all automated, the user doesn't, um, and other than in a few uh, special circumstances, the user doesn't really have to, to um, babysit this at all. Um, we, the Perplex takes this sparse set, it figures out what minerals are stable, it figures out the approximate composition of the minerals that are going to be stable, and then it throws away the compositions outside this range. So this, this first very rapid set of minimizations tells Perplex that in our fictional mineral here, um, the mole fraction uh, of this component only goes from, from six, uh, 0.6 to 0.9. It now knows that this is where all of the, the actions at. It resamples that at much higher resolution and it redoes its calculation. Remember, it's not just doing this for one mineral, it's doing this for all of the minerals. And so essentially what we end up with there is a final diagram that was calculated with a really dense set of um, pseudo compound sampling, but only in the places where Perplex has already, in, a, in a, a rough, quick calculation, figured out that the information is going to be useful. Okay. So the second strategy, and I won't go into any detail on this, is just that if at any pressure temperature point, Perplex decides that that looks like the most stable pseudo compound of a, of a, um, a solution, it can then kind of on the fly just make a few more pseudo compounds a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, and see whether they um, essentially uh, increase or decrease stability. And so it's got, it's got these, these processes that allow us to um, generate 
reasonably good looking, reasonably accurate, reasonably fast diagrams. So uh, I'll take a, a sort of a little pause from, from this section now, and we'll just talk about, given these strategies, what are some benefits and weaknesses of the code? A benefit is that automatically we find the lowest free energy surface. And so there's little chance of mistakenly calculating a metastable phase diagram or forgetting to um, consider a, a potential mineral. Um, there's also little scope to create a metastable phase diagram if that's what we actually want to do. So this benefit could end up being a weakness. Um, Perplex requires almost no user input once the calculation parameters have been defined. We could also put that as a weakness because the, the user has very little um, chance to um, get in and see how a calculation is progressing. It's far less useful um, as a teaching tool than programs like Thermocalc, where you have to build up um, the phase diagram kind of by hand. Um, another weakness is that every end member in, in the data set of choice, every mineral melt end member is automatically considered, uh, even though the phase diagram that we are calculating um, might be in a PT space, which is inappropriate for some of, of the uh, end members in that data set. We can exclude end members from our calculation, um, but we would have to do this manually. Dave Waters talked yesterday about um, the um, melt models popping up and becoming um, stable at lower temperatures where perhaps one wouldn't expect that to be the case. That would actually be a very common outcome of a perplex calculation in, in that pressure temperature uh, domain because perplex would automatically consider melt-end members if it could construct them uh, uh, from the chemical system that you're interested in. Another weakness is that, that even though there are many strategies in place to improve uh, efficiency of our calculations, it can still take many hours to, to finish. Okay, so let's jump to the next section, which is what does a calculation actually look like in practice? And so um, all I'm gonna do here is talk through just a few of the modules, a few of the codes, the programs that come bundled with Perplex, the most commonly used ones that would, one would want to uh, interact with if they were going to calculate, for instance, a pressure temperature diagram. And I'll dive in a little bit about the, the, the data that Perplex is using. So the most commonly used um, codes would be build, Vertex, Mimum, PSSect, and where am I? And apologies for those of you who have uh, got substantial experience with Perplex. Um, you already know this, um, but maybe we'll be able to, to go in and have a little look at how some of these are working. So let's start with build. What does build do? This is the part that the user is going to have some input. So uh, in the, the diagram that I drew a few moments ago, where I said I needed five minutes of setting up the problem, that was here. So what does build do? It takes thermodynamic data, it takes mineral solution models, and it takes user input, and it takes all of this information and, and generates a problem description file, a text file that we can edit later. When I say user input, I mean, what do I mean? Um, the user will answer questions like what chemical system should the phase diagram be in? Um, should fluids or other, uh, other phases be saturated? What equations of state should I use for fluids? Should we do anything else special with fluids? What should the axis of the diagram be? Pressure temperature or temperature composition or activity or um, chemical potential? And then what should the ranges be? If, if the pressure and temperature, what should the ranges of those axes be? Build will also ask the user what thermodynamic data set are we interested in and what equations for, for solution phases, what activity composition models should we be looking at? And so uh, if we, we dive into that for a minute, I said what thermodynamic data set should we use? Yesterday when we were talking about thermocalc, um, we, we heard that that's very much tied to a thermodynamic data set. Perplex really isn't. All of these um, data sets are available and will come bundled with a download. So Berman databases, Holland and PAL databases, 
um, Berman and Holland and Powell databases um, supplemented with um, fluid models from the Deep Earth Water database or supplemented with shear moduli from Kerrick and Connolly. And these are the sort of data that we might use to calculate the pressure temperature diagram um, that, that we're all used to seeing. Um, the secret data are, are present in Perplex. Um, and so we can calculate figures like this with secret, although it's, it's useful to note that more recent versions of thermocalc include uh, a lot more of the end members that we're, we might be interested in diagrams such as this. There are also um, deep earth um, relevant data sets. So if we wanted to calculate um, the uh, properties in the deep mantle, uh, we might want to use a different data set of which um, Sticks Rude and Lithgow Bertoloni are probably the, the most used, but there are other data sets and data for, for metallic phases present. And so the user will select which of these they're interested in, in doing and Perplex will read them. We should have a quick look at the structure of one of these. This is the structure of um, one of the Holland and Powell databases, uh, a fragment of it coded for Perplex. And so this is um, everything that Perplex would know after reading that data file for Forstrite, Phaolite, and Tephrolite. So if we zoom in on, on Phaolite, this, this is the name of the end member. This flag tells it what type of um, model it will be. So it tells it to expect polynomials um, and it tells us the, uh, the way that volume should be handled. These are reference state, um, free energy, entropy, and volume. These are the um, constants that will go into the heat capacity polynomial. These are um, constants that will go into the isobaric expansivity and, and the volume term. And so this is everything that Perplex will know and will carry into a calculation that could include failite um, and that could include forsterite. Of course, typically we don't want our calculation to um, produce forsterite coexisting with phaolite. We want it to produce olivine. And so a second file contains expressions for how to combine these. And that second file contains all of the mineral solution or activity composition models um, that are appropriate for all of the data sets um, and all of the iterations of data sets that Perplex knows about. And it's up to the user to choose which selection of activity composition models are most appropriate for the question that's being asked. So if we look at olivine, this is how um, uh, a Holland and Powell activity composition model for olivine is coded in Perplex. That's the name of the model. This is a flag telling Perplex what sort of model it is. This says it's got three end members. And so it's gonna go to the, the thermodynamic data file and look up tephrite, forstrite, phaolite, and those are the um, energies that it's going to be playing with. This uh, material here basically just um, tells Perplex um, how does it, does it um, consider the entire binary from no tephrite to all tephrite, or does it consider part of the binary? Let's not worry about this in too much detail. This is an excess energy function, a non-ideal term for uh, four-strike phaolite. This tells us that there's only one um, site of mixing, that there are two of those cations perform the unit, and that there are three um, uh, end members mixing on that. And so that gives us all of it gives, gives perplex all of the information that it needs, an entry part, entropy part, and a non-ideal non part. And so that simple coding for a simple mineral, we can expand up to more complex minerals. So if we wanted, for instance, to look at garnet, um, let's say we want to look at a more complex garnet. Um, again, this is just an internal flag that we won't talk about in, in detail here. Then there are the models essentially split into two independent subcompositions. Um, four species on the first site, so that'll be calcium, iron, magnesium, and manganese. Two species on the second site, which will be aluminum and ferric iron. Um, the, again, these are the end members that it should pull from the data set. 
and then these with an underscore i are m members that are not available in the data set so perplex will make out of m members that are again this just follows the the description or the recipe if you like in this original white et al paper in 2005. Perplex, uh, I've gone, it's a, a more complex model, so um, there's more um, terms in the non-ideal terms here. And then this is where the entropy model's created. Two sites of mixing, three cations on the first site, two cations on the second site. And so we can expand this again and again and again. And as we get to more and more complex minerals, these descriptions become longer and longer and longer. So this is the first third, of course you can't read it, this is the first third of a description of an amphibole model from Green et al, 2016. And it's a much more complicated model. And so it's a much more complicated description. I would contest it would be pretty easy for a novice user to code in something like this as long as they've got a template. It would be moderately easy for a novice user to code in something like this as long as they have a template. Coding in complex models, um, there is plenty of room for making mistakes there. Um, and so be, be really very careful about this. Anyway, let's get back to our calculation. We've got end member data, we've got solid solution models, we've answered some questions, builders produced a problem file. We're then gonna interrogate that problem file and make our phase diagram. And we do that in the code vertex. We run the code vertex, it takes, uh, the answers from here, it goes out and it finds the information in the, the relevant helper files, the thermodynamic file, the solution model file, and a file full of additional options that I won't discuss in detail now. It sits there doing its calculation for somewhere between a few seconds and a few days, potentially, uh, depending on the complexity of the problem. It generates some files that are uh, it's unlikely that any of us are going to spend an awful lot of time looking at. Um, some of them are actually um, sort of almost unintelligible unless um, you, you, you really know how Perplex was coded in, in the first place. And so we have these text files. We run these text files through an interpreter called PSSec for PS section, and that will make an image file which might look like this. And so to get to this, we, we ran three programs, build, vertex, PSSEC. If we want more information, let's say we want to extract from this diagram or from the um, calculation underlying this diagram, we want to extract more info, potentially on the composition of minerals or the abundance of minerals. We use another program called Where Am I? Where Am I asks us some additional questions. It asks us questions like, um, what mineral are we interested in? Or uh, what system property do we want to contour? And we, we run where am I? It reads the output files from Vertex. It creates a table file. This table file can be converted into a diagram with codes that run in MATLAB or a standalone code called Pi where, uh, Pi where am I? Or there are Python codes available to do that. But that essentially takes a text file and it turns it into something like this. Um, there are other options available to do this. Um, and so this is a contouring of the modal proportion of biotite within this, um, this phase diagram here. So that's how we set up a calculation. We've talked about how the strategy uh, or some of the strategy behind the scenes is working. The next thing that we might want to ask is, if we run a calculation, how confident are we in its result? Now, that's a very difficult question to address. And there'll be talks later this week on uncertainties. There'll be talks later this week in more detailed comparisons of um, the, the utilities of different programs. But one thing that we do want to make sure from, uh, from the very start is if we're using thermodynamic data and activity composition models from the Thermocalc project, does Perplex actually recreate the same diagram that Thermocalc would? So can Perplex replicate results calculated with Thermocalc when we're using the thermodynamic data that comes bundled with Thermocalc? 
There are actually two parts to this question. One of them's easier to answer than the other. The first is, can the code do this? Can the code, if it's given the right question, can it, do, uh, can it solve the problem uh, and, and approach the solution from Thermocarb? The other slightly more complex thing is, can the user actually set the problem up correctly? Which sounds a little um, trivial and sounds a little glib, but it's, it's actually harder than you might expect to ask exactly the same question uh, of the two pieces of code. And I've got an example coming of how easy it is to sort of make a mistake with that. The simple answer to this question, can Perplex replicate results calculated with Thermocalc? The simple answer is, is kind of yes. Um, this diagram we've seen a few times throughout this talk. This has been calculated in a few seconds with Perplex, and it's based on a and it's based upon a, a, a rock composition that several, actually quite a few years before I calculated this, I was calculating in Thermocalc. And so um, all of the all of my PhD calculations were in thermocalc, and this is a, a rock that's just uh, recreating that. And so, at some fundamental, trivial level, yes, we can we can redo it. There are subtle differences in these diagrams. There's a difference here. So this diagram on the right is finding a um, a series of equilibria that when I calculated in thermocalc. I just forgot to look for. And so um, there are differences there, but to an extent, um, Perplex is recreating Thermocalc's results. Let's look at a more complex case, a more difficult, challenging problem. This is figure six of, of White et al.'s um, 2007 uh, JMG paper. And it's, it's a slightly more taxing problem because it's in a more complex chemical system it contains melt, it contains more minerals. And so this is just directly um, copied and pasted the figure from that paper. That, so this is calculated with thermocalc. This is calculated with perplex using the same activity of the composition models, the same version of the thermodynamic data. It took several hours to calculate and ostensibly they look very similar at first glance. If I actually take the curves from here and I superimpose them on my perplex result, we find that some of them match up really well, like these. Some of them really don't, like these. And so the worst part of the diagram is in here. And so what's going on here? Why can't perplex solve the problem here when seemingly it can solve it here? It's got very little to do with perplex being at, at fault. Um, perplex is just a, a calculator, as I've already said. It has no brain of its own. Um, I should have used my brain a little bit more. I wasn't giving perplex exactly the same data as Thermocalc had been given, even though I thought that I had done. Within the paper that, that this was taken from, this discussion of um, a reduction uh, of the, uh, the enthalpy of anite, um, a, a correction of the anite free energy, which was present in this calculation, but for reasons that I've now forgotten, I had um, removed from the thermodynamic data when I was calculating this. So the, these differences here are essentially the result of a um, three kilojoule per mole um, mismatch in the, the energy of, of anite. If I just take the most, so the, the middle part of the diagram here, the part where it's good on the good, fairly good here, it's not at all good here, and I add in that correction to the anite energy and I recalculate, I get this. So the um, the short of it is that yes, Perplex can recreate thermocalc results. And I'm not saying anything about whether that's petrologically correct or petrologically useful. What I am saying is that 
if we're using data from Holland and Powell, we should be able to solve it and get the same solution as Holland and Powell. And so, yes, Perplex can do it, but um, it's a little bit of a minefield. It's very, very easy to ask Perplex essentially the wrong question or think that you're asking it the right question, but because it's uh, being fed so much thermodynamic data and so many mineral composition models, uh, just a tiny change in one of them can, can make a big difference. Anyway, once we've got a diagram, so this is a phase diagram that we have calculated that is similar to the, the White et al model. Once we've got that, it, as I've already said, it's trivial to be able to, um, from this to, to calculate contours of phase abundance or other things. So if we wanted to calculate the abundance of cordurite in this, um, this is a, a, a few seconds in the program, where am I? And then another few seconds, maybe a minute in the program, where am I? And then another few se uh, seconds or minutes in a program that converts the output file to a uh, contour plot. We can contour those abundances in volume percent or molar percent or weight percent. We can contour them as a fraction of the system or the system minus any accompanying fluid. If we can calculate the abundance of minerals, we can also calculate the composition of minerals. So this would be the composition, the almondine content or grossular content of, of garnet in, in this face diagram here. We could calculate the abundance of melt. So not very much melt in the blue shaded region here, lots of melt in the red shaded region here. I apologize that the um, contour labels are so small. I'll get to that in a moment. Once we've contoured the, the abundance of melt, we could contour the composition of melt, or if we wanted, we could contour the density of the melt or the density of the system. Of course, if we know the difference between the density of the system at any P and T and the density of the melt at any P and T, um, we learn something that could potentially be um, useful in, in a dynamic sense. So it's pretty, easy to generate these contour plots once we've got a diagram. The important thing is before we, we do this is to go and interrogate, interrogate the diagram and make sure that it's actually showing us what we, re we really think is useful. As I said, there are some very small labels here. If we want to publish these outputs, it's almost always preferable to go in and tidy them up in Illustrator or some other equivalent. So these show the, the, so the water content in, in minerals um, in, uh, as a function of, of pressure and temperature. And these diagrams were output by the perplex, but were tidied up and made quote unquote sort of presentation worthy um, externally. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the, the last section, um, which is um, sort of associated with this, this water case. Uh, to an extent and could be associated with a melt case. Everything that I've shown uh, is, is for a fixed composition or for a diagram where the composition is varying on the x-axis uh, and pressure is fixed and um, temperature is varying on the y-axis. What about path dependent calculations where we want to use the result of um, a low temperature minimization to modify the system composition at a higher temperature. That's also very easy to do. If we want to progressively remove the compositions of phases that have been calculated previously, um, we can do that very, very easily in Perplex. Obviously, this implies a path dependency. So Perplex needs a, a file or a description of the pressure temperature path that we're going to work on. I should also note that in this case, um, it seems to be particularly important to think about the, the, the resolution of that pseudo compound approximation. This is one of those cases where it's worth kind of stuffing the calculation with as much uh, higher resolution of sampling the pseudo compounds as, as is possible. It seems to be really important in this case, otherwise we can end up with spurious results. So let's say we've got a pressure temperature path We've got a rock of composition of known composition, um, and we want to fractionate something from it. All, literally, all we do as a runtime option is tell Perplex which 
mineral acid fractionate. And so here's an example. This is the pressure temperature path we're going to give it. And I literally discretized this path into a series of pressure temperature points that Perpex read from. As it read from those points, it calculated the stable mineral assemblage at the start. Then I told it, okay, I want to fractionate. I think in this case, I'm going to fractionate. If garnet is formed, take it away from the bulk composition. If fluid is formed, take it away from the bulk composition, then move to the next node and so on and so forth. And the result would look like this. Again, this is a diagram that was not directly out of Perplex. I took Perplex output and I plotted it up. I think I actually used Excel to plot this diagram up and then I tidied it up a little bit in Illustrator. But at each step along here, the system composition is changing based upon what the uh, minimization is found in the previous step. So essentially, um, the amount of water um, in the system is being reduced um, because every, any time a fluid phase is being calculated, it's being taken away. Any time garnet is being calculated, it's being taken away, assuming somehow that garnet is a refractory phase that can then not enter um, into a subsequent equilibrium. Whether, whether that's an appropriate assumption or not is maybe a discussion for a, another session or another day, um, but that, that's trivial to do in perplex. We could then compare this result perhaps to a case where fluid wasn't fractionated and we can have a look at the difference between the two. And here what we do is we build up a reservoir of fluid because we allow it to sit in the rock in the, in the model um, as we progress in pressure and temperature we could calculate um, an example where garnet is not allowed to fractionate. And what we see is that um, we end up with slightly different phase equilibria at the end, because this calculation here, the system composition is almost devoid of components such as manganese at the end when garnet has already grown. In, in this case, the system composition is actually quite different at high temperature. And so I think I'm gonna, uh, end there in a moment. I'll just go back to this summary of strengths and weaknesses. Perplex is flexible, extremely so. Um, it can automatically find the lowest free energy surface. There's little chance of it calculating a metastable phase diagram, um, but maybe we would want to calculate metastable phase diagrams in some cases. It requires very little input and it's, it's pretty straightforward to run. Um, weaknesses. Um, if you want to learn how phase diagram are constructed and how to interpret phase diagrams, um, I think there's no substitute for building them up by, by hand, so to speak. Um, one thing that, that we can do as a, as a teaching tool here, because it's so quick to calculate phase diagrams in Perplex, it's also very quick to calculate a series of phase diagrams where we just change one variable, maybe composition a little bit, and get a... Um, a picture, we can build up a, a picture of how that variable affects the, the solution. Um, there's this problem uh, about every, uh, every end member in the data set automatically being considered. I don't know whether that's a strength or a problem, but I'll put it as a weakness here. And then there's the thing about minimization it can take many hours. The, the, um, the strategies that have been implemented in the last few years have improved perplexes efficiency. It used to be that calculations could take days. I mean, I've had calculations take weeks in the past. Um, that has improved now. Um, and there are helper programs that help with that a little bit, but it can still take a little amount of time. And it is very frustrating if you allow a calculation to take, you know, a day of your life or, or a little bit longer. Of course, you can be doing other things while it's calculating. But it's very frustrating if you do that and then you remember oh, I forgot to add titanium, or oh, I forgot to add back in that correction for, for anite, or one of the other million things that could potentially go wrong. So perhaps a good piece of advice there would be to calculate a low resolution version of the diagram first that won't look pretty, won't be a perfect solution, but will at least give you an idea whether you're asking the right questions. Okay, so I'm gonna end there. There's some additional um, reading some additional um, information here and here. This information is available on uh, the, the PDF that's been uploaded, and I'll leave there. Well, I'd like, I'd like to thank uh, 
Mark for a, uh, a really impressive talk about Perplex, illustrating some of the details of the uh, complexity of how the, the program works, but also uh, counterbalanced with some uh, such valuable commonsensical points uh, about the need to really uh, think about what you're doing first. So uh, we'd like to go on to some questions now. Um, some questions have been posed in the Q&A session, and I think some of our panelists have been uh, answering those, uh, but there's a whole series of questions which we'd like to now move on to, uh, to pose uh, orally. So um, I think I'll turn things over to uh, Jacob at this point. Excellent. Thanks, Dave. And thanks, Mark. That was a, a really good talk. As not a, an avid Perplex user, it was great to see the, the functionality that I'm missing out on in places. Um, okay, yes. Yeah, so as Dave said, we've been going through your questions and trying to reply to them where we can and making a list of uh, them for Mark. So I'll start general, Mark. Um, somebody asking, what's the most common mistake that people make when they're using Perplex? in your, your um, I don't know, opinion? There are a few, and I've made all of them many, many times. I think perhaps the most um, common is that Perplex bombards you with a lot of, actually there are two, Perplex bombards you with a lot of information when it's running. It's worth reading that information. In fact, uh, this might not work. I'm gonna try to, uh, let's see where that, can you see my, can you see this? Yep. One I can here? see your terminal. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to really quickly run a calculation. Uh, Excellent, I think that's a great idea. Uh, whether this will work or not, pressure on, we'll see. Okay, um, so I've set up in, in build, um, and so we're just going to run the vertex part of it. It spits out a huge amount of information. This is really useful stuff. This, this tells us, it just diagnoses how Perplex is running and what it's doing. Um, one of the biggest mistakes that, that people, including myself, make is we tend to just ignore this information here. Don't read these outputs that are being um, pumped out as it's going. And then we're surprised at the end when it didn't work exactly as we anticipated. So that's finished. Um, let's turn it into a diagram and see what we've got. There's always a danger doing this live that it's just not going to work at all. And I apologize if that's the case. Okay, so that, yeah, that's rerun a diagram that we saw earlier. Um, the output here is, is worth reading, even though some of it doesn't make any sense. It's worth reading. Some of the warnings that pop up are, are worth reading. So that's mistake number one. Mistake number two is to not really read in detail all of the accompanying text that comes in the solution model file. So we decide I'm going to do a calculation and I want to include Garnet. And there are 12 different versions of Garnet in the solution model file. And I'm going to choose this one for, for whatever reason, I'm going to choose one. Um, there's text in there in, um, that suggests which, um, which faces that's appropriate to calculate with. Um, there's text in there that suggests any end members that need to be excluded from the calculation if we're using that. There's text that's, that describes any um, sort of uh, made or um, you know, made com uh, components that are required. And so not reading that in detail, I think, is one of the other major, major issues. Excellent, great. Thanks, Mark. A another um, general kind of question here. Can Perplex miss a reaction because it's not solving for delta G equals zero, which just interpolating? Yes, I think it probably could. Um, it, it's, I think it probably could. I think if we, if we have a dense enough sampling of pseudo compounds and we allow Perplex to spend enough time on the calculation, uh, I think that would be a very rare event. Um, we Remember that the GX surfaces are, are, are very, very shallow in some cases. And so the difference in free energy between certain, certain configurations might be very, very tiny. I think it is possible in that case to miss things. I think that's perhaps most, hopefully you can see this again. Yeah, yeah we can see a presentation. That's most uh, prevalent in the phase fractionation 
calculations where um, because it's only got a, a stripe of, of pressure temperature to work on, the adaptive minimization that I talked about right at the start doesn't work quite as efficient, effectively. And there it's possible not so much to miss an equilibrium, but to miss a mineral or, or a, a phase where, um, so I think in that case, it is possible for it to um, just completely pass over a mineral, which would only maybe be present at one or two pseudo compounds. And then we can end up in a, in a bit of a mess. So again, the, the trick there is to really interrogate the diagram um, and, and, and ask, ask the question, does the, type, does the diagram look like it makes some sense? Excellent. Yeah. And so you've, you've kind of stumbled onto my next question, talking about pseudo compounds. Um, a question here. Can you give us an idea of what is compositionally coarse versus fine in terms of pseudo compounds? You know, what percentage of steps are you using uh, when you, you, you say coarse versus fine? I think that was earlier on in your talk. Uh, OK, let's go to this. Oh, dear. I've gone way too far. OK, if I go to. You know, this calculation here. Um, the pseudo compound spacing was probably the initial pseudo compound spacing in the pre refinement. I was probably, um, I was probably sampling every 0.1 mole fraction. And then post refinement, I was probably increasing that resolution fourfold, maybe fivefold in this case, um, and go from there. The total amount of pseudo compounds needed to run this calculation was probably of the order 450,000, 500,000. If I'd increase the, um, the compositional resolution one step higher, I would have suddenly probably been one and a half million, 1.7 million. Um, when Perplex is, is compiled, we put limits on how many pseudo compounds are possible so that it doesn't scavenge all of the system memory, amongst other things. Um, and so Perplex will basically crash if there are more than a certain amount of pseudo compounds. And so there's this, 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 this tension. It is possible to build, pseudo, uh, build a version of Perplex or a version of Vertex that has a much um, larger suite um, available to it. Um, but that's generally not desirable. That's excellent. Yeah, you've once again stumbled onto my next question that was, what's the cause of the error too many pseudo compounds? Is it a built-in perplex limit or an actual um, purely memory thing on my computer? And I assume it's a, it's a limit. Uh, it's a built-in perplex limit. Um, so when, when perplex is compiled, there are a ser series of parameters that control, amongst other things, how many pseudo compounds. So if your calculation is failing, really early in the calculation cycle after you know just a few seconds what that means is that i'm going to go back a few slides if you'll permit me um, in this pre-refinement thing where it's it's looking at the uh, entire possible um solution compositional space for every mineral and every uh, mineral every phase um, if we're trying to sample too densely and we're doing that on a complex mineral like melt, we will exceed the limit of pseudo compounds that are permitted and so the perplex will, will crash. The strategy around that is to reduce the amount of pseudo compounds in that pre refinement run, allow it to say, okay, everything to the left and right of these appear not to be stable in my diagram anyway then to go in and set it up so that it, it samples much more densely here. There are still phases that this is, is problematic on, melts one of them, um, complex amphibole models uh, similar, in that sometimes we just need to sample those at such a sparse resolution in the first instance that um, we end up in, in, in difficult scenarios. There are helper programs that get around that, um, a program called Paralyze, it gets around part of that problem. But this strategy here is, is the, the best sort of catch all solution. Yeah. Um, okay, right, so perhaps something slightly uh, back, back a little bit more general. 
Um, Perplex is very versatile, for example, uh, in its choice of thermodynamic data and solution models and the, the choice that it gives you. Is that a weakness, uh, for example, for an inexperienced user or is somebody who's a geodynamicist and perhaps not a, a metamorphic petrologist at, at heart? Um, hmm, that's a good question. I'm going to be diplomatic here. I don't want to say anything positive or negative about geodynamicists. Um, <laughs> I think it's both a strength and a weakness. It, it, it allows us to calculate um, in a wide variety of chemical systems, in a wide variety of pressure, temperature, composition spaces. It leaves the door wide open for making inappropriate, um, putting together inappropriate uh, composition uh, uh, sort of selections of models and data. For instance, it. Perplex would allow you to take thermodynamic end member data from one database and combine those data with solid solution models that were calibrated for another database. Perplex would allow you to do that. It wouldn't tell you whether this was good or bad. It would pass no judgment whatsoever. It would be up to the user to decide whether that's a smart idea or not. I suspect in not every case, but in most cases that particularly for complex models, that is not what you might want to do, but Perplex will allow you to do it. So I think, yes, there, can, there is an element of um, almost, uh, almost option paralysis when you first see the list of things that you can do, and then there's the opportunity to make bad decisions along the way. Um, but with a little bit of care, I, I would see that as a, as a strength, just, just in the, you know, so, sometimes people want to do calculations in very different parts of PTX space than, than, than the classic metamorphic geologist. Excellent, no, I think that was a very diplomatic answer there. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, a few more getting into technical questions here, perhaps, uh, or, well, back to the program. When I select H2O as a saturated component when I'm building my calculation, does that mean that a saturated H2O fluid is assumed to be present? Yes. We can, in that we can, can we could we could saturate it in water, or we could saturate it in a fluid with a composition of water. We could also saturate it in a fluid of different compositions. So we could saturate it in a fluid of you know X CO two point one or point zero five if we wanted. But if we if we're adding uh, if we're saturating in water as fluid, then um, it will assume that there is always sufficient H two O present at the pressure and temperature of interest to produce a fluid phase with a composition of water. Okay, excellent. And so the, the next um, question was leading into this kind of idea of mixed volatiles and mm -hmm. how can we set the activities and fugacities of H2O and CO2 in the fluid for computations in perplex? And then kind of a secondary question, um, can we use a buffer such as QFM? Um, that's two parts to that, I think. Yes, I think I'll, I'll, I'll deflect that question a little bit for now because on Friday morning, uh, uh, Doug Tinkham and I are going to give a presentation on mixed volatile systems where we'll show examples of some of those things. And I will keep a note of this question and I'll try and put some information in about exactly how I did that. The, the short answer is yes, we can do this, but let, let's wait a couple of days and I'll show some examples. Yeah, I think that, that sounds excellent. Okay, um, Perplex often finds many immiscibilities compared to Thermocalc. Are there errors in the solution models which could be improved or is it appropriate to turn immiscibility off in Perplex? Um, okay, that's a great question. So just for the uninitiated, essentially what Perplex does when it finds immiscibility or when it decides that there's an immiscibility Let's say if we look at this green surface here, it would say, okay, this appears to be a stable composition and this appears to be a stable composition. It then looks at the different, the distance between them. If the distance between them is more than a, um, I, I say distance, I mean sort of compositional distance. If it's more than a, a critical uh, threshold, it will say, okay, those will exist as separate phases with composition A and composition B. If those two are very close to each other, and the user can control this to some extent, uh, if they're very close to each other, it will say they can they uh, exist as a single miscible phase. 
that's really easy to show in a simple binary like this. Um, it gets very complex um, in, in multi-dimensional systems and particularly some minerals, um, more complex minerals. Again, amphibole is a good example where um, in nature we might expect to see, um, I don't know, a, um, a sodic um, high pressure amphibole in certain parts of PT space coexisting with a tremolite or ferroactinolite or somewhere along there. And so then Perplex would be able to say, okay, these two things appear to be stable as separate phases. It does run into difficulties sometimes with um, distinguishing um, maybe too many um, miscible phases, immiscible phases. Um, normally, it, it seems possible to be able to um, understand why it's doing that. I think you could use the code um, to reveal how solution models are running in parts of solution space that they were maybe never considered to be run in, a PT conditions that were never considered to be run in. Um, but again, I'd be very cautious about making statements about whether that, you know, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Okay, yeah, that's great. Um, a question here regarding fractionation. I know you talked a little about this towards the end of your talk. Um, are you able to add phases to the system as well as fractionate phases along the PT path? Um, it used to be that in an automated sense, no. In a, in a semi-automated case, yes. What you could do is you could say, here's my 1D path. I'm going to fractionate out for the first 30 steps, then I'm going to terminate the calculation, go in manually, change the bulk composition, and then pick up again. So we can we can break it up and have a little bit more uh, manual interaction with it. Um, Perplex now includes a 2D fractionation model, which is a sort of form, and I've not really played with it a lot, a form of the reactive transport um, where you can model a column of rock and at any point in the column of rock, if, it, for instance, if a fluid is produced in biominimization, it'll automatically be passed to the cell above it and will be allowed to interact with the cell above it. And then we uh, in, uh, in, increase um, pressure or temperature. So there are semi-automated ways of doing it. If, if we really wanted a lot of control over that, it might actually be smarter or, or easier to manually go in and break the calculation up into a few steps and manually modify the bulk composition to simulate the addition of, of a fluid or, or anything else at a certain point. It, I think the important thing is in those 1D fractionation calculations that I showed, once the composition of a mineral has been taken away, once garnet has been taken away in a, in a minimization, Perplex is no longer aware of the existence of those components that have been taken away. The, the bulk rock composition has been irrevocably changed um, from Perplex's point of view. Okay, great. Um, another one here about Paralyzer. Can Paralyzer be used to calculate PT projections using the program convex? And would this be possible in the future if not? Uh, no and yes. No, it can't because I, I uh, never asked it to, and we never set it up to. Uh, if there's real interest in that, I guess it could be coded to do that. Um, as I sit here now, that sounds like it could be a lot of work, but I've no idea. Um, <laughs> I, in theory, I think it probably could, but no, it doesn't. At least it was never set up. To, I've never tried to. Okay, excellent. I, yeah, I think that answers the question. Um... Perfectly. Okay. Um, can you please comment on the option file modifications? I've tried to do it a few times to improve curves, but is it wise to do it all the time? What are the precautions that any someone should take whilst you're um, making, the, if you're going to make these modifications? Okay. Um, the easiest way of answering that is for me to share an option file so that everyone knows what I'm looking at. Yep. Sounds excellent. Can you see that file? Yep, I see everything there. Excellent, yeah. 
All right, so a lot of information. These are the options that are available to Perplex. Um, you can change any of them and um, see, you know, see what the, the result is. The, the ones that um, pertain mostly to the, the pseudo compound approximation and particularly to Perplex quitting um, sometimes would be, let me have a look here. Uh, this thing, initial resolution, which I've set as default here. Um, I'm going to change it from default to 1 over 25, 1 over 100. What that means is that um, pre-refinement, we're going to sample all of the, um, the solution chemistries at quite high resolution, um, so 1 divided by 25. Then post-refinement, we're going to go in a sample at even higher resolution. That shouldn't be a problem. This shouldn't be a problem because hopefully, unless we're looking at an enormous PT window, all of the minerals will only occur in very small uh, compositional ranges and we'll be fine. This number could get us in trouble, particularly if we want to calculate with melt or we want to calculate with, with uh, amphibol. This will probably or possibly already put us over that 1 million pseudo compound limit. So let's just knock that back to that. We're now sampling the initial grid at really low resolution. Um, but as long as it captures all of uh, enough information about all of the minerals that are present, then, then um, post refinement, we, we should be able to, we should be better. So the user can modify these. And what I always would suggest is for each calculation that you run that works fairly well, um, keep an archive of that entire folder so that you, you always know what the um, parameters were that were being used. Um, there are a few parameters that are unlikely to ever be changed. As you can see, there are many parameters in here. I only ever really, 99% of the time, I change 5% of the parameters. Um, these, for instance, X nodes and Y nodes, they control, if you think back to that grid and minimization, they control how many red dots there are. Uh, in the pre-refinement stage and in the post-refinement stage. If we look at grid levels, where on earth did I leave that? Grid levels, that controls in that, that refinement, are the red dots, blue dots, green dots, black dots, or are there also higher and higher levels of, of uh, iteration? And so that what this is telling us is the default is one, four. What that's telling us is before we refine the composition of minerals, we're just going to do a quick PT grid where we only look at the initial red dots. Post refinement, we're going to start on that red grid and then we're going to go down three additional levels of complexity. But the user can modify these. The code should generally still run, but again, read the vertex output while it's running because it will tell you what it, think these, what it thinks these values are. And sometimes it'll give you a hint as to maybe if there are some that are inappropriate. Great. Okay, a few more kind of perplex program oriented or, uh, yeah. Um, I downloaded perplex for Mac and it doesn't run. Uh, I think having troubles and, and a couple of other people talking about troubles running it in the command line <laughs> and yeah. why. Uh, okay, so that's actually uh, a multifaceted answer. So. You need to know your way around Unix a little bit to get it run, to run Unix with DOS to get it to run. Um, but there, there's, there's, there's information, there's help out there on the on the web about how to, to navigate your way around, how to get it installed. If people are specifically downloading it for Mac and it doesn't run, then that's an interesting problem. So when Perplex is compiled, um, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but when Perplex is compiled, it requires some, some uh, math libraries that are generally not, they, they don't come on every Apple Mac. They don't come in your operating system. So when it's compiled, we either have to make a decision to bundle all of those libraries into the, the Mac, into the Perplex program, or assume that they will be available on the system that's being run on. The two people who make the, the codes, the binaries for um, Macs are, well, there are a few people who, but generally, if you go to the Perplex website, there'll be versions available made by me or made by John Schumacher, previously of Bristol University, now in 
um, in, on the west coast of the states. We take slightly different strategies. So John doesn't statically link or doesn't link those libraries. Um, his code, I suspect, runs a little faster and more efficiently than mine, but it is less um, likely to work on any given Mac computer. My versions link those libraries. I suspect they're a little bit slower because I don't uh, compile them that efficiently, um, but they should work on most modern Macs. If there's a problem um, with that, um, let Jamie know if it looks like it's a problem that I should know about helping me an email and he'll ask me to recompile with some different options. There are other workarounds to this, incidentally. Other people have um, posted workarounds for if it isn't running on your Mac, how, how do you go out and find those um, libraries and install them? Um, those solutions work. They're a little bit complicated, but, but they're out there. And I think many of them are actually posted on the, on the chat group. 